Lalu 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 Med. It's me, Dr. Lalu Med. Today, I'd like to talk about end of life care for patients, uh, particularly in the hospital, hospital, but also applicable to people uh, outside of the hospital. I had um, one of my coworkers very experienced doing hospice and end of life care, and they gave up. They handed a printout and talked about it for a bit. And um, it's very interesting. A lot of these things I didn't know, and I thought it would be interesting to share this with everyone. Um, and I'll also interject with a few thoughts of my own. So, end of life care. The hospital and healthcare can't save everyone. Dying is inevitable. I feel like in Western medicine, people um, are hesitant to accept that for themselves and their family members which is pretty sad to see people struggling to live when you know that the inevitable is coming. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. Dying is just part of life. <clears throat> so, caring for dying people is a privilege. It is a sacred moment, regardless of how they lived and who they love or didn't love them. We are, the la we are often the last people they see, and we are spending their last moments on earth with strangers. Our job is to make that moment as comfortable as possible. That's the point of end-of-life care. It, it's the end of their life. So um, the priorities are not uh, recovery or healing, but rather comfort. So there's two roads. The usual is sedated and unresponsive. Um, and then there's difficult, the difficult road. Restlessness, agitation, and seizures. A painless, calm death is called usual as it should not be the exception, but the norm. And um, my coworker also went on a, on a tangent here, talking about the history of death. Oftentimes, people, well, not often, but in history, uh, people died the usual way. They were, you know, weaker, unresponsive, and then they just slowly pass, slowly and peacefully pass, which is what we all would like to wish for, I would hope. Um, Nowadays, with the advent of healthcare, we live artificially long lives. I always like looking at the statistic of the ex life expectancy 100 and 200 years ago. Right now, it's about 80 years, and then 100 years ago, it's about 60, then 200 years ago, it's about 40. It's been relatively fast compared to the time we've spent, or the time spent. So people are living longer and longer lives, prolonging their life um, either naturally or in other, not I wouldn't say unnatural terms, but like uh, maybe it, it would be unnatural with the help of science, that sort of thing. Um, like let's say you had uh, something wrong with your bowels. You had IBS, you know, you couldn't process food well. Now we have like, you know, gastric tubes, G-tubes. We have ostomies if you have problems pooping, that sort of thing colostomy, that sort of thing, um, superpubic catheters if you have problems peeing. Like, there's ways. Uh, science and healthcare have ways of um, dealing with missing or problematic organs for most things. Yeah, if your kidneys were failing, um, you have dialysis, you have to go three days a week for the rest of your life consistently, consistently if you want to live. But that's also an option, dialysis. You know, a lot of Failed or failing organs can be supplement, supplemented with with healthcare. So there are the phases of death. Phase death. Phase of death. Uh, the first one is actively dying. It lasts a, a few days to a week. Averages three days. The clinical presentation: patient has pain, dyspnea slash cyanosis. Dyspnea meaning. Um, Difficulty breathing and cyanosis, meaning like blue skin. Uh, fatigue, cough, incontinence. Incontinence meaning pissing or shitting yourself. Loss of appetite slash wasting syndrome. Nausea and vomiting, seizures and tremors. So in this phase, when the patient's actively dying, uh, the nurse's role is to manage their symptoms. You have to treat restlessness as anxiety and treat grimacing slash dyspnea as pain. Um, the patients or the people are not necessarily able to communicate their needs or their uh, status. Um, 
I particularly like uh, med surge and adult health because your patient is able to tell you a lot of the things. Like if you worked in peds, if you worked in the ICU, they're either too young to understand or too sedated to communicate. And um, when it comes to adults, you could be like, okay, is your history this, this, and this? How do you usually do this, this, and this? And you're able to communicate to help aid them in their health. But um, in certain situations, like end-of-life care, they're not able to. So you have to treat restlessness. If they're moving around, if they're shuffling, if they're moaning and groaning, you know, you got to treat that as anxiety and pain. Uh, nurse also has to keep them clean, patient gown and sheets. We're not really caring about, um, like, what do you call it? D uh, infectious disease prevention, uh, for the patient or the people around the patient. Not necessarily. It's more a dignity thing. And the environment. Keep the room free of clutter. Turn down lights. Speak slowly and quietly to help decrease anxiety. One of the last things, one of the last senses... For a person or a person senses to go is hearing and um oftentimes we uh the healthcare staff we suggest talking to the patient as if they were awake telling them stories reliving memories that sort of thing that's very helpful not just to the family member help processing their loved one dying but also uh for the patient too they're able to hear even if we don't think they could hear always assume they're hearing um another example um when i was a newer nurse there was uh there's a guy pretty much not comatose but like he couldn't speak he couldn't talk he could barely move like his whole body was paralyzed pretty much he his eyes barely moved he would kind of track you track his eyes when you walked around the room but barely right he's like partially blind but it, but he had his hearing and i had forgotten i had i had forgotten so i go in there with a tech you know uh one of the people who helped the nurses and um we're cleaning him up or something and then um i say something along the lines of Oh yeah, you know, he's not expected to live that much longer, you know, his prognosis isn't that good, you know. And um I guess no one ever talked about that in front of him because he started tearing up and I had I I think I'd taken care of him a few times before that point. And so I was like, "Oh fuck. He heard me, he understood." And uh I think he heard me and I think he understood. And I started to reassure him. I was like, no, 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 it's okay. It's okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't I didn't mean to say it like that, you know. Like, um, you know, we'll try to make you as comfortable as possible. But yeah, I fucked up. I remember him tearing up and I was like, I've never seen him tear up and cry before. But uh, yeah, All we, after uh, w looking back and remembering that, you know, even if patients seem to be comatose, you know, there's evidence that um, they're able to hear. Like people who have near-death experiences or are close to death, and then they um, they recover for a little bit, and they're able to exclaim, like, recall conversations that was had in the room, that sort of thing. So always assume patients can hear, people can hear. Um, engage and educate the family. So the nurse, when the patient is actively dying... Ask if there are any questions about the process. If there, they have any questions about the process, ask if there's anything they would like to talk about. Very open-ended. Um, when gathering information, especially when it comes to tasks related to nursing and healthcare, you you don't frequently ask open-ended questions. That's like a psych thing, you know. That's um. You know, to derive information from people who don't necessarily understand uh, the human body, right? Um, like, okay, what kind of pain is it? Is it, if you ask them like that, without giving examples, they're just like, oh, it hurts, right? You have to ask, okay, is it aching? Is it burning? Is it crushing? Is it pressure? Is it pulsating? Does it come and go? Is it continuous? Does anything relieve or relieve it or make it worse, right? You have to ask it in that way. So they could say, you know, they could say yes or no or pick one of the options because they don't necessarily know how to communicate it. Um, 
but in the dying process, you uh, talk about very, very psych, a lot of psych, ask open-ended questions. Um, an important thing is avoid being too cheerful or too grim when talking. You know, you want to set the a very neutral tone and approach death and the dying person very neutrally and allow the family to process it. Oh, I think I forgot to mention. Um, when dealing with end-of-life care, there's often uh, close ones, loved ones, family members, friends, um, and they are all your patients. It's not just the person actively dying, uh, sitting in the hospital bed, right? It's not just them. All of a sudden, all their families and friends and uh, loved ones are your patients too. So you set the tone, very neutral. Um, I know in the hospital, one of the rooms was close to the nurse's station and one of the patients died. And it's a normal thing for people to die in the hospital. And we're, we've all become used to it by now, right? Um, and they were laughing at the nurses. People were laughing at the nurse's stations, nurse's station. And I was just like, you know, I stopped talking. I wasn't laughing too, but I was like walking past and like some of the family members were going in and out of the room of the guy who was dying. And I was like, huh, I wonder, I wonder if, you know, the people, you know, taking it easy, laughing, treating it, everything as normal in the nurse's station is, um, uh, I wonder how the family members felt about that. But it's a normal thing. And the hospital is like, you know, a shared space. Unfortunately, unfortunately. Uh, we also educate them on what is likely coming, the potential symptoms, and how we are going to manage them. And we have to clarify the difference between allowing death and causing it. One thing, I have one very anxious co-worker um, who works in the morning. Excellent nurse. Really good. He will do everything in his power to keep you alive and healthy. And satisfied, too. Um, uh... But um, he, 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 he told me a story, end of life care for someone, right? And I think the brother or the sibling or the son was in denial, in denial of death and dying and the whole process of it. And every time uh, my anxious buddy nurse goes in the room, the guy would go, oh, here comes the death squad. <laughs> like excuse me sir we're not here to kill your loved one we're here to make them comfortable right we're here to give them you know morphine to help with like um i'll talk about that later to help with like the need for breathing like the fight the fight to breathe right to ease that uh difficulty to ease that pain but no he was in denial he was in denial about death and the inevitable and yeah and would consider the healthcare staff and everything they did, you know, to be his antagonist. Fucked up, man. Fucked up. Quite rude. Anyway. Um, oh, medication makes it easier to breathe and therefore the uncomfortable fight to breathe, fight to breath, decreases toward the end of life. You know, there's, um, I think, kusmal breathing and agonal breathing. Kusmal being like, you breathe really fast for a little bit, like... <laughs> And then um, you have periods where you alternate between that and, like, not breathing. And and the not breathing part can go up to, like, two minutes, from what I understand. Breathe real fast and then slow, right? Um, giving them something to eat or drink when their organs are not functioning causes discomfort. They are not starving because that sensation gets turned off at this point. Family members who don't understand uh, how the body shuts down, right? They'll continue to try to feed their loved ones, you know, water, hydrate their mouths, um, feed them like, you know, sweets, maybe things they like. But um, because they are actively dying, their, their organs stop functioning, their digestive system slows down. And it could like, you know just kind of pile up in the stomach. They can't process and enjoy the food as much as we think they can. So it's much better to um, not give them any, not not starve them, you know, but, um, and like 
if you give them water, they're not necessarily able to swallow healthily. And it could go in their lungs, you know. You don't want that. That's very uncomfortable. It could cause a drowning sensation, right? That's how um, my coworker nurse uh, described it as. Um, how you explain it to the family members, right? It, it it could give them the sensation of drowning, that sort of thing. So we don't want to give them too much food as they die. I feel like, as an aside, I feel like some people, they um, they. Maybe they weren't there for their family, or maybe they um, split apart on bad terms. But um, when, oh my God, I'm thinking of a different depressing story. When when people are dying, um, wait, what was I talking about? I was thinking about the depressing story. Uh, there was this wife and daughter who was like, they were like 40 or 60, old, older, right? And they were dressed like very provocative clothing, is what I was told. And they stressed that they wanted their husband slash father's fingerprints so much. And you know that shit is all about money somehow, right? They're like, oh yeah, you know, uh, I think they said, oh yeah, I, the daughter just wants uh, the fingerprints, her father's fingerprints to keep it in a locket for her, for her memory. Bullshit, man. You're trying to like open a safe or some shit, right? Like, make sure you get his fingerprints before he gets sent to the morgue. Like, what the fuck? What the fuck? Man. Okay, that's what I was... That thought I was distracted by. But, um... What do you call it? Uh, God, I can't remember the original aside I was gonna... Something about death, obviously, but... Uh, anyway. Moving on until I remember. Uh... So, allowing death and causing it. We do not overdose them. We only give them what they need for the symptoms to resolve. It's a lot of symptom management. Um, again, rather than healing or treating the cause, right? Um, just making them comfortable. So, the next phase of death is transitioning. Uh, last hours to days, usually about a day. Transitioning to the dying state. So... I'm reading off this paper. The clinical presentation. Time between actively dying and imminent <laughs> imminent death. So they're withdrawing from the physical world uh, with a decreased interest in conversation slash interaction. Uh, hallucinations equals death awareness. So my grandmother, my grandma, when she died, um, she passed really comfortably. And one of the things that she would hallucinate about near the end of her life were parades. She's like, oh, there, there's parade. Oh, the, the nice parade is like going by. Look at that, everyone. You know, um, and I'm very happy that she was able to see something so pleasant before she died. Not everyone sees shit like that. Um, yeah. Uh, hypoxia, respiratory rate elevated, fever. Death rattle, grunting, apnea, apnea meaning, again, no breathing. Death rattle is like the gurgling sound, it's like, <laughs> right? The body is like struggling to breathe, right? Um, but uh, they're not able to easily draw breath, which is why we give stuff like morphine. Q15 minutes, like one milligram. That is a lot of morphine for a living person. That is not a lot for a dying person, right? We have our protocols. Um, so for living people, usually you want to space opioids about an hour apart, right? You know, Dilaudid, 0.4, every two hours. One hour would be really annoying. They ought to be on a PCA pump at that point. But, um, for, uh, morphine and for dying people, every 15 minutes as needed. And you pretty much, and they usually also have scheduled morphine too. And you could give the Q15 on top of that. Again, comfort, comfort. Um, chain stokes and agonal breathing. Hyper extension of the neck. They're like sticking their neck straight out. And that's them trying to instinctively straighten their throat to get more air in. And um, if you give them morphine, if you give them, if you lessen the, the struggle to breathe, they will naturally like, you know, lower their head to um, a more comfortable position rather than overextending the neck 
trying to open up their airway as much as possible. So the nurse's role in this transitional stage, increase in dose frequency. If order allows for medication every 15 minutes, give it until symptoms are under control. These are studied protocols, right? If every 15 minutes, it's fine. Again, this much morphine would be like bad for someone trying to stay alive, right? But if you if the point is comfort, right? That's okay. Increase rounding. Aztec to check in on patients in between rounds and treat hallucinations only if they appear to be causing distress. Again, my grandma had very pleasant hallucinations as she was passing away. Uh, parades and parades and all that, you know. Uh, oh, I remember what I was going to talk about. I feel like some people, they they leave on a... They disconnect from their family on not the best terms. And then by the time they're dying and they're forced to interact and see their family member in a horrid state, right? Um, they try to often overcompensate. We see this a lot. Like, be way too demanding, way too controlling, asking way too many questions of, like, you know, unhelpful questions, you know, at unhelpful frequencies, you know, or demanding things that are not necessarily good or necessary. Um... They're trying to overcompensate for their absence in that person's life. And then suddenly, you know, a person is dying and now they have to care, right? They overcompensate, try to do too much, too little at the end, you know. It's kind of annoying and it's like sad to see, you know. <sighs> too distant, too distant. All right. The transitional stage of death. Educate and engage. Explain that the rattling they hear is just secretions in the throat and is not uncomfortable. It's kind of like having a bubble in your throat when you're talking. Bubble in your throat while you're talking. You know, it's just, you know, little little chunk of air right there. Show them the difference between agonal breathing with and without facial grimacing. Point that Point out that loud breathing doesn't always mean they're in pain. Again... You know, the patients at this point are not able to communicate their needs, their wants, their discomforts. So we have to treat their symptoms as we see them. Do not be afraid to tell them that it looks like it's close and ask if there's anyone that would like to be present. Encourage them to come to the hospital. Uh, my experiences mostly revolve around stuff in the hospital, right? And... um in acute care not critical care that's icu and um step down intermediate care that sort of thing right just regular med surge i'm just your average everyday med surge nurse but um i've noticed that especially when the when we have end of life care hospice people right they often do not have family i feel like it's western culture to be so individualized that you don't you know have a relationship at all with your family members um the people who raised you or the people you grew up with right they often break apart and stay apart so they often they're the people are often alone it's really sad it's depressing you know don't die alone in the hospital go die at home you know die where you're comfortable um Encourage them to talk to the patient. Tell them they could hear what we are saying. Again, one of the last sensations to go is hearing. And, um, you know, recalling stories, uh, telling them, giving them updates on your life or other people's lives, you know, just talking to them about anything and everything. It's good. So, imminent death. Last minutes to hours. Clinical presentation of imminent death. Decrease heart rate, blood pressure, and respiration. Because small breathing, long episodes of apnea can be up to two minutes. They begin to look dead. I think it's funny that she she just puts look dead in quotation marks. Um, if they're, uh, they get very pale. Skin is gray, mottled, cool extremities. Your heart is weak, weakening and it's not when you're dead, immediate death. Um, they look like yellowish or pale often. Their heart is uh, stops beating at that point, right? 
So it's not able to push blood from the bottom of the body. Like if they're laying down, it would be like the back, the buttocks, the sacrum, the bottom of the legs, right? It's not able to pump that blood upwards against gravity. So it kind of pools at the bottom in the body. So their the their face and stuff end up looking like, you know, um, very gray or yellow or dry instead of like pink. <clears throat> uh, skin is gray, mottled, and cool extremities. Eyes are slightly open. The extremities are cold because your fingers and your toes, your hands and feet, are the furthest away from your heart. So if blood, warm blood is not pumping, being pumped to their extremities, that's a sign. Uh, the nurse's role in this uh, uh, scenario. Remain with patient if no visitors, which is very often the case. Give them education as needed. Encourage family that it's time to say goodbye. Turning in and cleaning patient will often trigger death, so consider it beforehand. At times that might be okay. Other times you might wait until death occurs. I did that once. I I was like, yeah, let's uh, let's clean and turn them. You know, make sure they were dry, right? And they were like very close to death. You know, probably in the imminent stage, unable to communicate, just breathing. They had, you know, the Q15 morphine, whatever. And then, and I think an hour later, we go back in the room and find them dead. And then everyone was like, bro, bro lime, bro. <laughs> you don't move your patient when they're that close to dying, because that often triggers it. That causes them to die, right? The, the minor... The minor, minor stress of moving around, rolling around in the bed is enough to, uh, you know, push them over the edge, I guess, <laughs> into the next stage. <laughs> Fuck, man. Oh, my God. But it was expected. It was expected for them. I still feel bad, though. Shit, man. I could have waited until day shift for that. Uh, once patient stops breathing and heart rate is undetectable for one minute, immediately notify doctor and make note of the time. Um, we don't necessarily do that, like, uh, time of death is always determined by the doctors or hospitalists on, on, um, covering. The protocol is you call them, they're supposed to come in and assess them, and then be like, okay, this patient is dead for sure, right? I'm a doctor and this person is dead. <laughs> it's very official. And then they're the ones to call the time of death. Um... I had the experience of calling, notifying the hospitalist, hey, uh, patient, patient recently died. Can you come in and, uh, you know, declare time of death? And they were like, they typed back to me, okay. And then I think 10 minutes later, I see a note by that hospitalist saying that he assessed the patient, patient not breathing, eyes unresponsive, heart undetectable, time of death, so-and-so. And he did not go into the room. I was like, and I, I tried to nudge him. I was like, um, are you still going to see the patient? Right? <laughs> and then he was like, I already put in my note. <laughs> I already put in my note. And I'll, I was like, okay, okay, buddy. All right, man. All right. Shit, man. All right. You, you know, you, you go by my word. Okay, I, 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 I appreciate that. And I guess you don't want to walk over to the other corner of the hospital, but okay, man. <laughs> yeah, patient dead. I didn't even look at them. You know, I wasn't even in the same vicinity. Yeah. Anyway, tips for end-of-life care. Do ask for help. Ask the charge nurse or hospice nurse or physician if they have insight on how a patient seems to be doing and how close the patient seems to be dying. Uh, do assume the patient can hear everything you say until their heart has stopped beating. Again, very important. One of the last senses to go is sound, hearing. Don't be afraid to ask the family about their loved one who is dying. Like, ask them, you know, what kind of person they were? were they, you know, what kind, of, what kind of hobbies they had? What kind of life they lived? It helps them process. Don't assume that just because the family is present that they had a really healthy relationship with the person dying. It's hard either way. It's hard to lose someone you love, and it's hard to lose the chance of having a healthy relationship. Again, I've noticed that families who are not present, you know, absent at the end of the days, um, they overcompensate by being a little too proactive, right? And this proactivity is, like, not a good thing. It's them trying to compensate for... 
uh, you know, all the times and energies that they, you know, did not see their loved one. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's hard to lose someone you love, you know, if you really cared for them, losing them forever, essentially, is um, not easy. And also losing the chance of repairing and mending that relationship. By the time they're in end-of-life care, they're not able to, like, you know, communicate as, as well as easily as they could when they were lucid, you know? So, um, getting your redemption, getting your forgiveness, whatever it is, right? You lose that chance, and you'll have to live with that for the rest of your life. Uh, know that cleaning a patient when in the transitional or imminent phase often triggers death, really. Yeah, I learned that the very, very, very distinctly. Uh, we don't know when someone is going to die. We can give, uh, usually at this stage, the average is whatever, right? But always give the caveat that people sometimes go quickly and sometimes take way longer than expected to pass. Sometimes it helps to say, people usually die like they live, and that will be interpreted in whatever way is most meaningful for the family. Again, the family is your patient as well at this point, and if you give an open-ended statement, people usually die like they live, and it's kind of true, right? Um, they're, they're able to interpret that and process that as they wish, as they know the person. Um... For family members who are struggling, this is a good tip. For family members who are struggling with acceptance, just ask how they are feeling. If it has taken them by surprise, or if there is anything they were hoping to do or say before their loved one dies. These questions really open the conversation, and if you just listen, they usually talk themselves into acceptance. The extra 10-minute conversation is not only incredibly healing for the family member, it also makes easier to work and care for the patient when the family is working with and not against the process. Again, the example I gave where the dude was like, oh, yeah, here's the death squad, right? Not helpful for morale, not helpful for doing stuff, you know. Um, a tip they, uh, she suggested was after, ask after, uh, no, ask how do they look now, you know. Um, ask them how they got to this point, like the story of their life. And then the family member will, like, you know, re re regale what was most important to them. And then you say, how do, you, how do they look now? And if they're having a difficult time accepting that their loved one is dying, that someone is dying, <clears throat> um, processing through their life, talking through it, thinking about it, and then seeing where they are now, and hopefully, hopefully, seeing that they're comfortable you know, that they're dying in a peaceful, comfortable way. Hopefully it makes them accept the process or helps them accept the process. Yeah. I had a, I've had a few, uh, but this one couple, one old couple, uh, old Korean couple, right? Husband actively dying. Wife was there at the bedside. She, she was one of the people who uh, slept in the hospital, right? Right beside her husband of how many years? Uh, and, um, yeah, it, I feel like it took her a while to accept because they were trying to do life-saving measures for him, but nothing was effective, nothing was working, and then eventually she decided to do, uh, end-of-life care in the hospital, and, um, you know, usually they have, like, end-of-life care, like, at home, you know, you take the person home, the person who's dying, and then you just have, like, uh, staff come in to the home. That's what they did with my grandma after they decided it was time to, for her to go. And um, you make them comfortable in a environment that they're comfortable in, you know? And, yeah. She, she, she ended up kind of accepting it, and I don't know. I don't know. The decision to transition to end of life care, hospice, comfort care, that sort of thing, it's a big decision. But even though they make that decision, they might not necessarily be ready to fully accept death. Um 
So some vocabulary. She put this at the bottom. Agonal breathing is loud gasping breaths. And we give morphine and Dilaudid for that. Again, it's to... Morphine and Dilaudid helps deal with pain. It slow. I think of it as slowing down the functions of the body. So it slows down your processes for pain, right? But it could also slow down your uh, digestive tract. You know, people who abuse opioids often get like, you know, crit like l uh, life-threatening constipation. Like, not a joke. Like, you, they need surgery to get like a solid brick of poop out of their body. Um, but another thing that it does is slow down respirations, your natural rate of breathing. So... Um, Again, we want to deal with the fight for breathing, not necessarily the breathing, and it makes them more comfortable. So we give a lot of morphine. Chain Stokes breathing. Pattern of breathing alternating between rapid deep breathing and apnea. Apnea, again, meaning period of no breathing at all. Uh, the death rattle. Gurgling sound built up from saliva. Rubinol is often given to dry this up. It's like... Is that the little patch that they put behind the ears? No, that's a cholamine or whatever. But um, you don't want them to be wet. You don't want <laughs> this dying person to be like, you know, gooey and ooey and wet. That's the way I think of it. Like, you want to dry up secretions in their mouth so it's a little more comfortable for them. Um, again, don't give them like water or things to drink at, when they're at this stage because it just gives them the sensation of drowning in their lungs. Their body isn't able to process the food or water or drinks. Uh, Kusmal breathing. Purses lips, slow, long exhales. It's the body's last attempt to resolve acidosis. Uh, modeling. Discoloration, mark spots, or streaks on toes and fingers. Yeah. Yeah, end of life care. I feel like people don't talk about or accept death as easily. Uh, in most cultures, I would say. But especially in Western, in the Western world and in Western medicine, you know, people kind of assume that, oh, well, I'll just take them to the hospital and they'll get better, right? But that's not always going to be the case. People die. It's inevitable, right? Until we have the elixir of immortality or upload our consciousness to the internet, right? You know, things fade, things disappear, things die, things are lost. Thank you for listening. I wanted to do something like this for a while, and um, <laughs> this printout that my coworker gave me, um, coworker gave us, uh, very helpful, very organized. And I was like, oh, maybe I'll, I'll make content out of this. <laughs> I'm kidding. I think it ought to be shared. It's very good. I'm sure there's also a lot of resources out there about um, how to process death and end of life care and the nurses' role, healthcare workers' role in it, and all that. But, uh, yeah. And again, one of the reasons why I wanted to be a nurse in the first place is that they're the ones who are always by the bedside. The docs, they're important, they're smart, right? They're the ones who diagnose and treat. And um, they go in there, they're like, you know, see you for like an hour, 30 minutes maybe, to an hour, and then they, you know, talk with you, look at you, examine you, and then walk out, right? But the people who are by the bedside... Um, it's the nurses taking care of the patients, you know, asking how, seeing how they're doing, checking on them constantly, making them comfortable, right? And that's why I wanted to be a nurse, you know. I wonder if end-of-life care and hospice or palliative care would suit me. I wonder about that. Thank you for listening. Otsulaim.